Access Credit Union has always been at the heart of our community through good and bad times. We want to continue to play our part in helping our community through the COVID-19 crisis. As businesses reopen, we encourage our community to work together by staying local, borrowing locally and spending locally. Access Credit Union is here to help. Close your eyes and pull like a <laughs> And a new Irish record for Phil Healy, 22.99. Christy Cooney hands over the Sam McGuire Cup to Graham Canty, Cork All-Ireland Champions for the seventh time ever. Hello and welcome to the Star Sport Podcast. My name is Jack McCarran of the Southern Star and I'm joined on this week's show by freelance sports journalist Ger McCarty, whose work you'll find in the Southern Star, the Echo, the Irish Examiner and the Big Red Bench on Red FM. Before we kick things off this week, I'd just like to give a gentle reminder to our listeners and viewers to please rate, review and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. The more ratings, reviews and subscribers we get, the more we can continue to grow the podcast. Now on with the show. On today's podcast, we'll be chatting to the current Celtic Ross West Cork Youth Sports Star of the Year, Fiona Keating, about the challenges of being a dual star. This year already, Fiona has enjoyed senior club success in both ladies football and camogie, winning the football title with West Cork and camogie with her club, Corsi Rovers. The reason we wanted to talk to Fiona today is because Cork are scheduled to play Galway in the All-Ireland Camogie Championship on the same day Cork play Kerry in the All-Ireland Ladies Football Championship. And on Saturday, the Camogie Association decided against implementing a rule geared towards facilitating dual players so there's plenty to dissect with Fiona. We'll also preview the return of the National Football League as the Cork footballers get their Division 3 campaign back up and running with the visit of Loud to Parky Cueve on Saturday. Rowan McCarthy's side have already secured promotion to Division 2 for next season, but we'll see Saturday's game as an important step as they prepare for the meeting with Kerry in the Munster semi-final on November the 8th. But sure, let's start with the dual player debate that has been dominating the headlines, it's fair to say, over the past few days. This problem of camogie and ladies football clashes is not a new one, as we well know, but it seems to have really come to a head in recent days following some of the comments made by several of the Cork dual players, including the idea of a strike being floated. You cover both camogie and ladies football closely, so could you maybe give us an outline of what the current state of play is and why no solution has ever been found despite essentially years and years of debate and clashes over this issue? Um, that's a very good question to start with, Jack. Uh, I think the problem lies in at, at the top, actually, with both the Ladies Football Association and with the Camogie Association. Um, they have long always, because they're two separate entities, uh, they have long, as, the, as is their remit, protected their own particular sport as best they can. So when fixture lists are drawn up for inter-county seasons, invariably um, there are players, not alone in Cork, but throughout the country who play both camogie and ladies football at senior level up on the receiving end of fixture lists where there are clashes. Over the last number of years, the level of communication between the two associations I described as terse at best. Because if you look at the men's side of things, especially at the club scene in Cork, there's very few dual players now compared to maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. The likes of Mark Collins, uh, the Catalans, from where Castlehaven don't play hurling at senior level, um, are playing for the Bars and for Douglas, respectively. So it, it, it hasn't been as big an issue on, least side, on the men's side of things. And I don't help the ladies, unfortunately. I think, and this is my opinion, I'm not saying it's true, but I think both associations, the Camogie and the ladies' football, would prefer that the whole thing went away. Uh, it would be easier. But the reality is there are five Cork players. Um, Libby Coppinger, who we have an extensive interview with in this week's Southern Star. Um, uh, Fiona Keating, who we're going to hear from shortly. And three others, uh, Maeve Cahalan, uh, Hannah Looney and Kira McCarthy, who are involved in both panels this year. So what has happened is because of COVID, the championship, which would now be over the stage in both Camogie and football, is only starting. But when the two sets of fixtures came out, there was already, first thing, there's three potential fixture clashes between curlers. 
sorry, the Cork Camogie and the Cork Senior Footballers, which is a disaster. Um, in the interim, as you pointed out, Camogie voted 76% in favour of turning put forward by the Dublin uh, County Board or by the Dublin GAA to talk or to introduce some sort of I, I mean I don't know the full details of the motion but it was obviously an idea with facilitable players and that was shot down at ladies football level to be fair to Camogie as well earlier in the year um, neither side seems to want to take a step back in this neither side in my opinion I say sides associations wants to seem to be facilitating or, or taking a backward step to the other sport and that's where the problem lies and until people have been talking about an you know, Olympi maybe one association to handle both football, which would potentially sort this out, um, until something like that comes along, and I don't see that happening in the in the short term. Unfortunately, players like Libby, Peter like Keating are going to get caught in the crossfire, which is what has happened here. Now, there's been talk in the past week. Um, at one stage, there was talk in the past week of um, uh, a potential of strike bike. I think it was Cork's that's not necessarily on the cards I think that's like the nuclear solution I think that's the nuclear potential issue that, that might come down the line but it's obvious he's interviewing this week's owner star is from Fiona in the in the interview we're going to hear shortly they're fed they're fed up there's frustration this isn't this didn't just happen this year it's been happening for far too often it doesn't look like it's going away and that's I think what's upsetting the players the most like Galway have since intervened and very sportingly offered to move the Camogie match on the seven to the four hours, which would facilitate that weekend. But we can't be relying on individual associations to step in and do the job that the Camogie Association and the Ladies Football Association should be doing. Pointed out, one phone text between Cork and Galway pretty much started the Camogie issue on the 7th of November. It hasn't, there's still two other dates to come. Why can't the agents pick up the phone and deal with it? What's going to happen if they saw each other's fixture lists? This could all have been avoided. It's not going away. I don't know what, what road it's going to go down. I hope it doesn't. The militant role, which is being thing that solves anything, and I think the players lose out on the long term. But what's abundantly clear, Jack, from interviewing Libby and talking to Fiona is they are fed up, fed up of being the ones caught in the crossfire of all of this an issue between two associations that's going on for years and doesn't look like it's going away. Yeah, and I think that's a very important point. It's the players who are having to come out and speak about this when they should really be focused on playing, training for both codes. And like in an idealistic world, the GAA, GAA supporters and all the associations involved with running the games and boy, and the GAA also includes say, the Camogie Association, the LGFA, all our games, there should be a concerted effort to promote dual athletes because there's something so special about the few players who can play both codes and so everything like we should be moving mountains to allow for dual players to try because throughout history any joe dual hurler and footballers they go down as legendary figures very famous examples in cork like jimmy barry murphy and similar things should be done to protect the dual players in ladies football and camogie as opposed to making the players come out and fight for the right to thrive into two and i know i'm speaking idealistically there but i don't see why we shouldn't speak idealistically when it comes to dual players the likes of libby coppinger should be put up on the pedestal and supported in any way shape or form possible to thrive in both sports because it's people like her who promote the games to people all around the country if ever there was a better example of what you've just outlined than fiona keating is that person what I already won two Camogie All-Irelands and one Football All-Ireland. Um, in the past two months, she's won a senior club Camogie title with course and a senior foot with West Cork. And she's not; she's only turned 19. Plus, she mentions in the interview all the other accolades she's won with a particular school in Kinsale. She's a shining example. I, I mentioned in the here at Chartley that she is she is somebody that girls young girls all over cork not just west cork look up to and it's not something that you know they kind of laugh at the players we say to them but it's true and the ballon hospital can area that watches fiona keating young girls will eventually pick up a hurley and try to copy and mimic what she's done she's a hero living on that same is true in west cork anytime we see her playing senior football for west cork she is she's a future star now she's she's breaking onto the two senior intercounty squads that she may not she may not she may be on a kind of an on the outside looking in for her first year i i personally think we'll see a bit more of her towards the, the end of the championship but that's for another day and another podcast 
But if the Cork LGFA and Cork Camogie Board, which deserve huge credit here as well, because they have always set, tried to negotiate as best as they possibly can their fixtures for the two, for Libby Coppinger and players like Fiona at the two associations. It's like they're not looking for, the, the Cork players are not looking for a change, complete change to the fixture schedule. They are looking for 24 hours. They're even willing to play two inter-county games in 24 hours apart, which may not necessarily be the best thing in the long run for them, but they're still willing to do it because they want to play the games they love. And the one word and the one set to finish the point that I keep hearing in these interviews, and Libby said it, Laura Tracy kind of said it as well this week, and Fiona says it, they will not put one sport above the other. They won't do that. They won't say, right, we're not going to play Camogie. They have consistently down the line all these years, including this year, said either sort it out or we won't play either. Never put Camogie above foot or of Camogie and I think that's commendable because this kind of pressure uh, tends to force some people to choose one sport and stick with it whereas what we're trying to do especially in Cork which at ground level uh, in my own club in Clonakilty when there's communication you've usually got like at under 14 under 15 it's hard enough to keep girls involved in sport between the 15 to 18 19 and if you've got these kind of shenanigans going on it does seep into their subconscious and they kind of go well you know what's the point if there's only going to be issues with me playing camogie or foot to choose why bother each stamp it out and if we can't stamp it out at national level it's going it's going to get worse it's not going to get better that's the thing i think the two associations which is bugging me the most are standing back from this and hoping that a lot of players will sort themselves but we saw in tipperary only a couple of weeks ago uh, a club issue involving some of the inter-county footballers that down to the wire before getting sorted We've seen, it, we've seen it in other counties it's not going away you have to address the fact and like what, what even bugged me even more was that on World Mental Health Day remember that putting the players into this and bombarding them with interviews and asking them to speak out on it it's not an easy thing to do not for a 19 year old like Fiona Keating and certainly not for Libby they don't want to be spokespersons for the issues between the two associations going on every couple of weeks and every once or twice every year defending the right to play the sports that they love and they shouldn't have to so that's what annoys me the most in all this. The Camogie Association and Time for Association to lead and to do what they were elected to do on their respective boards. Not to do the day-to-day -day running, but to do to make the tough decisions, sit down across from each other and sort it out. If Galway can pick up the phone sportingly and ring Paddy Murray in the car Camogie setup and text him and get it done in a couple of texts, what hell are the two associations? Well, I think that's a good point to finish our discussion on Jura. So let's throw now to your chat that you had earlier on with the jewel star we've spoken about, Fiona Keating. Okay, absolutely delighted to be joined by um, minor All-Ireland Camogie and football winning and in 2020, senior Camogie club winner, of course, your overs and senior football winner with West Cork. Fiona Keating joins the Southern Star, Southern Star podcast this week. Fiona, thanks very much for joining us. How are you? I'm good, thanks. I'm still coming down, I suppose, after the busy few weeks I'm after having, but uh, I'm delighted to be joining you here on the Southern Stairs podcast. Yeah, before we talk about the topic that's dominating a lot of the headlines at the moment, just from a player's point of view, first of all, you've just come out of a club cycle um, where you got congratulations on both the Corsi and West Cork titles, fantastic for you especially, but you've been training non-stop with your, two, with your club and with West Cork, your division, you're immediately out of that and then you're into the inter-county cycle where you're with both the hurling, or sorry, both with the Camogie and the senior footballers. What has that been like? Yeah, I suppose we went back at the, uh, around the week of the 14th of September and I suppose we were still in club action around then. So I had a busy few weeks there until the club uh, action kind of quietened down a bit after the finals and stuff. So I nearly consider this kind of period as a bit of a rest more than anything from the past few months I'm out to have like, but um, air, it's great, you know, after winning the two counties, I suppose. We were there and thereabouts with uh, West Cork the past few years. And you know, it was great to just kind of get over the line this year. And I suppose our core sees, you know, we lost the final against Inniscar two years ago. And things just didn't really go away last year, I suppose. So to be back this year in the county final and to finally go that step further and that as well. And so in it was just fantastic. And, you know, the year 2020, if you told me a few months ago that you'd even get the chance to play a championship. I wouldn't barely believe you, but you know, to come out and win the two of them, I suppose I'm just absolutely delighted. Yeah, it's it, it's a serious achievement to win one county medal, as you well know now. Like the effort that, um, course your overs had to put in this year. I mean, I, I spoke to some of the players in your team, and Karen Can, a lot of players 
were talking about the fuel of having lost that final. I was going to ask about that and being getting close and just wanting to get over the line. Whereas with West Cork, it was more or less the same. But yourselves in Morn Abbey, you played often each other often enough. There was nothing new in that. But to finally get over the line in one, but to get over the line in two at senior level at your age, and you're still relatively young uh, when it comes to the senior level, that's a terrific achievement. And any injuries or any lingering issues when you came out of both those finals? Uh, no, I suppose compared to two years ago when the two finals were on the one weekend and um, this year was a bit different you know we had two weeks in between the two so i had plenty of recovery i was well able to play the two in the two weeks but um no i suppose as you said west cork were there there about and i suppose this year was a a bit different you know not having the inter-county season going ahead and i suppose we have so much girls involved with um cork as well in west cork they kind of gave us the chance to like proper training and stuff this year compared to other years and you know I think we got the chance to gel more as a team and you know kind of get to know each other more better but um no I think that made a big difference for us this year. I'm asking everybody I interviewed this year it's become the the go-to question I assume you're a favourite or you would be in favour of a club calendar and inter-county calendar especially in your situation. Yeah I suppose you know at minor level playing club and stuff I didn't really have many problems um, you know, I suppose the two Cork County boards are very good working together. And you know, we never had any clashes with any club games or anything like that. But yeah, no, I suppose seeing this year how it went, it went really smooth. And you know, we got the chance to train with our club as well. And it's nice to go back to Inter County now and just kind of focus on that for a few months. So yeah, I think it would be. A, I would be in favour, yeah. Yeah, which brings us unfortunately onto the headlines and in, uh, in the media that have dominated over the last seven days, the news that both the LGFA and the Camogie Association uh, came out with their fixture list for the upcoming championships and with three potential, at least two, but definitely probably three fixture clashes. Uh, Cork ladies footballers will be down to play the same day on November the 7th and later on in the month as well uh, as the Camogie. Now, uh, we've already spoken to Libby Coppinger and there's a big interview in this week's Southern Star with Libby where she lays out the frustration for her and for yourself and the three, three other girls who are dual players at senior level for both Cork Camogie and football. Can I ask just what your initial reaction was when word filtered through that there was going to be, there was definitely going to be issues with fixtures at inter county level? Yeah, well, I suppose, as I say, I've come from just up from minors, so we never really had any problems like that. And I wasn't too aware of um, clashes. I know there'd be maybe one a year, but I suppose the year that's in it and this tree this year. I think, you know, it is hard, especially on the five of us, I suppose. And I know there's all over the country and Tipperary and stuff, they've had clashes. But, like, it's not a, a nice situation to be put in. But I feel I feel particularly sorry for um, Hannah and Libby, I suppose. They've been here the past few years, and, you know, they keep getting told that it's not going to happen again. And for it to happen again this year, like, I suppose we're not, we're not, e- not even asking for, like, a, a perfect solution, you know. We're just asking for them not to be on the same day at the same time. Like we can live with a match on a Saturday and another one on a Sunday. That's kind of what we're looking for. And to be fair to Galway, they're already after um, mm. offering to change the Camogie match to the Sunday to facilitate us. So it's kind of up to the two associations, I suppose, now, whether they're, they're going to go ahead with that. You know, I suppose that only took two text messages, maybe, for that to be arranged. But it's up to the associations now, I suppose. They were kind of letting us down in a way by not facilitating us. And is that the most frustrating thing? from your point of view, Fiona, because you, you are proof positive that a player with your unbelievable talents at both sports has been able to achieve what you've achieved at minor level without any real interference with fixtures. You've been able to do that with Cork. You've been also proof positive that at club level in Cork, that the Cork Football Association, Ladies Football and Camogie, by communicating, have allowed you to win two senior medals in the space of a couple of weeks. Is that really the frustrating thing, that when you get to the national stage, you're asking, what's the story here? We can't even move for 24 hours. Yeah, I suppose when you look at it at a like a core county kind of level, you kind of you're happy, I suppose, that none of nothing is clashing. And at minor level as well, I suppose I, that's a step below senior, obviously. And I I could see that they could deal with the situation. They never had any clashes, so I just never thought it'd be that big of a problem when you got to senior level. You know, being that next level up again. And I suppose it is frustrating, you know, seeing the likes of Libby and Hannah and Maeve, Kira and myself. Like we nearly see each we see each other going a few times a week. And, you know, I see the hard work they all put into training and stuff. And it's just kind of like a smack in the face back on them, like not being able to facilitate them and allowing them to play the both games when they're well capable of in the 24 hours. And this is the thing. I mean, even, even asking somebody to play inter-county within 24 hours is a stretch at minor and senior level. But, I mean, when you're willing to do it, 
and everybody knows you're willing to do it and you've always said that you're willing to do it and then for the two associations just not to make not, as you said it took two two phone calls and maybe a couple of texts between Galway and Cork and it started it, it I, I just can't feel I get the feeling that I know I can see you're frustrated I can hear the frustration but you're are you asking yourself like I mean you know what's the story I mean it's nothing to do with you the individual the five individuals are the people in Cork or in Tipperary or in Dublin for that matter and then you see the Camogie Association voting by 76% not to put through a motion in Congress that might support future dual players. I mean, that's got to be equally frustrating. Yeah, it is. I suppose those results have only come out in the past few days with the Camogie, the 76% um, against it. But I suppose it was the same in the football mm. when they voted going back before COVID. It was the same result. And that is disappointing for us, you know, as dual players to see, you know, the headquarters kind of down frowning upon us and kind of just not not agreeing with us and supporting us and especially that's in it 20 by 20 you know they're encouraging young girls to keep playing and participating in all in sports and to see the our headquarters going against us like that is really disappointing and frustrating at the same time you know that's the last thing you want to be seeing okay so look especially with covid we don't know what the next couple of weeks or even months hold we don't know how much of a chance hopefully we get to fill complete both championships, especially behind closed doors at inter-county level, and let's stay positive and assume that's going to happen. I mean, your mindset as an inter-county player, I assume all you're doing right now is you're just focusing on the next training session because that's all you can do. This has got to get sorted out, and it's not up to you to sort it out, but you're hoping and you're putting your faith in the two associations that something positive can come out of this. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, I suppose it is down to the associations at the end of the day. And to be fair to Paddy and Ethy, and, you know, both sets of management have been so, so supportive towards us. And, you know, they're just willing to do whatever um, to help us in any way they can. But um, it is disappointing with the two associations. You know, we just try to focus on training and stuff. And, you know, we don't want to be worrying about, oh, will we have to pick one over the other? You know, and like the girls as well, like we don't want to do that to our teammates, either on Kobe or the football. Like that's the last thing we want to be doing is picking between the one, uh, or between the two, sorry. And I think it's just unfair on the girls as well. And the five of us, I suppose, you know, we don't want to put anyone out or annoy anyone. And we train just as hard at both training sessions, you know, uh, between the Kobe and the football. Like we'd hate to have to end up picking one or, you know, anyone being annoyed at us for picking one over the other, I think that's not a situation none of the five of us want to be put in. Yeah, and look, I don't, I don't want to spend the whole podcast talking about it because I understand how fed up the players are and you're just waiting for direction. But whether the two associations have forgotten or not, you're ambassadors for your sports. I mean, there are young girls all over West Cork that look up to you, down Ballon Spittal and all over West Cork when you play football. And they do. I mean, I say it to them, I, I can see you laugh. I can see when players say that, they laugh. But I, I've said it to... A lot of the players in the West Cork team is that you realise when I go to under-14 matches and I cover underage like that, they talk about you. They talk about the players in the ladies' football team. And over the last couple of years, because of the 2020 initiative and because we're all the time pushing ladies' sport, female sport, to be on the same level as men's as it should have been, and it should be long ago, these kind of things are backward steps, especially when you see the talent that's there and the ability that you have as an example and the other girls have quite easily play both sports to the best of your ability, even, even 24 hours apart. And I suppose what I'm kind of saying is, as ambassadors for the sport, whether you like it or not, you know, we're trying to get the best out of V for the next generation to follow. Yeah, I suppose, you know, when I was growing up, it was kind of Rena Buckley, Breach Cork, and those I kind of looked up to. And even the past year or two, I, I suppose it was Libby, you know, I played alongside Libby with West Cork for the past few years. I know she's been so good to me through my transition from minor to senior level, you know, that's not easy. And, you know, I'm still kind of finding my feet with both teams. But, you know, having there, her there, she's kind of now who I kind of look up to. I know she's only a few years older than me. She'd be laughing at me saying it to her, but, you know, she's been so good to me past few weeks and months and stuff. So um, as ambassadors, yeah, I think, you know, especially Libby for me anyway, has been someone who I've been looking up to the past few years. She's so nice. I've never, I've yet to come across a nicer girl than Libby. But yeah, I think you've said it all there in fairness to you and, and uh, there's not much more you can say on the matter. Hopefully, as I'm saying, I'm trying to say positive that the inter-county seasons get finished and everything with, because of COVID and hopefully common sense will prevail at the top level and that you get to play without any hassle and all the matches and fixtures are fulfilled. Can I ask you something? I, I witnessed a training, a Cork senior ladies training session last weekend and I was taken, not, not taken aback, but the intensity of that session and as somebody who's come up from minor and I'm asking both in terms of inter-county football and inter-county camogie, how have you found it 
physic in terms of physicality in terms of the mental toughness now that you're going to have to have because you're up against some serious operators in both squads to get your place as good as you are now but has that been a big step up has it been a shock to the system or were you gradually introduced to it even when you were at minor level yeah i suppose it is a big transition in terms of physicality and skill and stuff but um i suppose i joined the Covian football teams before uh, last december you know in pre-season training for in the gym and stuff and i i kind of saw straight away the difference but then i um decided to uh, stop both teams you know for my leaving certain stuff i wasn't prepared to commit to two and i didn't want to pick one of the other half commit to one and i was so busy with my school sports as well i just thought it'd be best to um stop until after my exams so when i came back in september then i suppose i noticed it straight away when we got onto the pitch sessions and stuff in terms of like physicality and skill and stuff when you see what, the lights of what was that first session on the pitch like for say let's take Kamogi for example were you blown out of it at one stage <laughs> um yeah i suppose it is scary you know, with all the girls you've been watching on tv over the past few years you know like um chloe sigginson and laura tracy and ashley thompson just to name a few i mean they're incredible players and in the football i suppose the o'sullivans and you know anya terry and all them they're just unreal and i suppose you know coming up against the likes of them is scary and i suppose i'm not gonna lie <laughs> my legs were trembling the first few trainings but now that i've got to uh, Got to terms with it all, I suppose, and got to know the girls much better and stuff. Um, I'm more comfortable going training now, and I know I'm in for a hard session every um every training session I have. I know it's going to be hard, but you know it's so worth it at the end of the day. And I don't ex- I don't expect anywhere to be anywhere near starting 15 in either teams. You know, I suppose for the time being, I'm just there for development. I'm, I'm only 19, so I'm, I have a few years to go yet before I'm anywhere near there. Yeah, that's she's only 19. Look what you've achieved already. Well, we'll see how soon or how. How soon we'll see you on the inter-county pitch? I think we might see you sooner rather than you expect, but that's just my own opinion. Um, can I ask you about the two managers in your life, inter-county? I, I would describe them as unique characters, uh, and that's the nicest possible sense. They're both very good guys, Paddy Murray and Ify Fitzgerald. They know their sport inside out, incredibly passionate about Cork, uh, GAA, Camogie, and senior football. But uh, going into a dressing room, you know, with all those players that you mentioned was intimidating enough, but how much of an influence already uh, on your inter-county career have those two managers been and, and what are they like? Both from the outset um, back in December when I did decide to stop they were both so understanding and they totally see where I came from so I suppose from that point of view they totally understand players and they respect their decisions and stuff and nothing was held against me when I went back in September but uh, I can see already I think I'm after developing more especially I suppose in football seeing as you know I wouldn't have as much training and stuff at my club and balance bill you know we're more of a camogie club so i do see in terms if in football terms the way i am i am improving already and i think with camogie as well i think i get on very well with party and i suppose i'm still getting to know them both as well at the same time you know we've only been back a month but you know i'm very fond of the two of them at the moment anyway i think um i think i'll get along with them for the years to come that's a very good answer for somebody new to the intercounty senior scene well put that you get on well with them that keeps you under good books for now um can I ask you about the celebrations uh, after, of course, he's won that senior title? Uh, I'm not looking for the full details now, but, and obviously we were in COVID uh, regulations, lockdowns as well. But um, what was that like? I mean, uh, the, 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 just getting time amongst yourselves as that squad and that group, because you'd been through so much together to finally have that trophy. It's, it's the one thing from the interviews we did in the Southern Star over the last few weeks. It keeps coming through in all those articles just the fact that they were able to, you know, that trophy was there with you when you were celebrating. I assume um, very, very enjoyable celebrations, yeah? Yeah, I suppose, you know, once the final whistle blew in Castle Road, I think it kind of hit us that we actually won. You know, I suppose in Ascara is such a dogged team and, you know, I know we were we won by four goals, but like you never, you can't give up until the final whistle and you never know it in Ascara, you know, they could come back with anything. We saw that in previous years when they played other matches, but um. I think some of us were just kind of still coming to terms with it. You know, our first senior county title after 21 years, it's been a long time coming, especially for the more experienced players on the team. I suppose I'm only up there now two or three years, so I'm still kind of new to that as well. But um, the scenes in Balance Spittle and Valady were just something else. I mean, I can't even describe it. You know, people just standing outside their houses and, you know, with their flags and uh, parish is all red and white the past months, I'd say, two months nearly. Um, everyone still has the flag side because no one's taking anything down yet but um, coming into Ballast Spittle that Sunday evening that's just something I'll remember for the rest of my life I can't even put into words or describe the feeling um, 
of the homecoming, you know, and I suppose Ibram was obviously spread out and stuff. It wasn't one big group or anything like that because of COVID. But um, no, just the support behind from the parish and from everyone around, really, I suppose, you know, going back to like neighbours and, you know, even teachers I had back in um, Kinsale, you know, they still follow the journey and, you know, you get the best luck texts and everything. And, you know, when you come from a, come from somewhere with such support behind you, you know, you try off that and you just want to, it pushes you on more and more kind of. And, you know, as you said with those previous interviews, it just meant so, so much to everyone in the team. And, you know, especially after losing the county final two years ago, I think we were that bit more mature and experienced, I suppose. I suppose I was 17 at the time and I know two years isn't much of a gap, but um, I think it did really stand to us this year. And, you know, we were so hungry for it, even all the matches against Cladova, Nisa's Town, Catrins, Douglas. You know, I think we we built more and more on and worked um, harder as we went on through the season. But uh, I think just getting over that final line, and this year was just absolutely amazing. Well, that's lovely. And it's lovely to hear you say as well, like the, the community coming out to the front doors in the middle of the COVID pandemic of all times to win a county for them. I mean, it's especially uh, special for them. Um, I happened to be there the day West Cork finally got over the line as well, turning to football and beat Morn Abbey. And I, got, I could see firsthand the, uh, the raw emotion of you and all the other players and everybody on that squad and Brian and Anna Grady and everyone behind the scenes and what that meant to West Cork. Uh, again, another very quiet reserve squad that year. I presume there was very little celebrating or much I'm going to be told about. I don't think I want to know anyway. But um, can you remember that moment? Can you remember the immediate aftermath? Because in and around the pitch that night, it was, it was just lovely to see what a group of players that I had witnessed over the last number of years on that journey. It sounds so American to say, but it was a journey because you'd been, you'd been knocked down a couple of times at the final by the best, the best of the best in the country uh, in, in Morn Abbey to finally get over the line. Is it slightly different for West Cork in that it's not a club? Or does West Cork have that club vibe about it for you? Um, well, the past few years, you know, I didn't get as much of a club vibe, but this year I completely felt like I was playing with a club. You know, it didn't even feel like division. You know, we were training two or three nights a week and we got that chance this year. And, you know, you just got to know the girls a bit more better. And, you know, you have some gas characters on that team between Anya Terry and the Kylies, Keena Maguire, Emma Spillane. I mean, the list is just endless. And I'd say we drove Brian Demented. I'd say he was glad to see the back of us <laughs> after the final whistle against Moyne Abbey. But, you know, it was great to get over that line for them as well, you know, for Brian, James, Anne and Michelle. You know, they put so much hard work into us the past few years. And, you know, getting knocked back twice the past two years and to just finally get over the line this year again. And to actually beat Morn Abbey, I mean, it was absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, they're such a physical skill side. I mean, they're All-Ireland champions for a reason. But um, to, for West Cork this year, it was just extra special to get that one. Indeed it was. And you very expertly negotiated those, those two questions without giving anything away about the aftermath or the celebration. So your both sets of teammates will be delighted with you uh, in case that I get any uh, information for the podcast that I shouldn't. Um, before we wrap it up, um, look, we already said we don't know what's ahead for Fiona over the next couple of weeks and months. We hope we'll see you making an appearance at, if, at one, if not both, senior level and inter-county level, um, again, because of COVID and because of the way things are with fixtures, that all has to be teased out. But 2020, when you're a, a, little bit, a little bit older, when you're 22 or 23, when you look back on the last 12 months, I mean, it's phenomenal. I mean, to, to have won the All-Irelands, the three All-Irelands titles that you've done at minor level, but to win back-to-back club senior medals in two different sports is a huge achievement and I, I just I get the impression I don't think it's dawned on you why would it because you're in the middle of doing it but that over time when you later on in a couple of years they said when you have time to look back on it hopefully you'll understand that this is an incredible achievement because so many players as you know go through their whole playing careers and they never get a county medal to win a camogie and a football one in the same year at senior level at the most competitive it's probably been as you rightly said this year because all the teams had time together more so than they ever did because of COVID. Um, I mean, have you had time just to even stop and think about what you've achieved? Um, yeah, I suppose. I don't think it's really properly hit me yet, I suppose. I suppose particularly the past few weeks with uh, college starting up and stuff, I've been busy enough with that as well. But um, I think I got the chance, on, it was only two days ago, I watched the um, County Camogie final. That was the first chance I got for that. But um no, it was a great year, to be fair. And I suppose with the school as well, we won our All-Ireland Basketball Medal and our first Munster football title. And I think, you know, the school has played a massive, has, has had a massive impact on the player I am today as well. 
and you know the support I got from my school was something else you know my teachers he's open the gym and stuff in the school for me at seven o'clock in the morning you know like Mr Abbott and Miss McKenna but um I don't think many schools would do that and you know even the sport support from the deputy principal Miss Sheehan and Miss Stone and Mr McCarthy I mean there's a long list of teachers who have helped me throughout the way or throughout the journey as well you know I think I should give them a mention and you know all that um act of kindness hasn't gone unnoticed but uh it was it wasn't great um it wasn't great ending to the school year, but I went into school yesterday. I uh, picked up um, the senior sports award and my brother picked up student of the year. So it was nice to go back in and just kind of thanked him and, you know, showed some appreciation for everything they've done for me over the past six years. And, you know, I suppose as well, going back to the club and West Cork and all that, um, my management teams on both sides, you know, I couldn't speak more highly of my two sets of management teams. I mean, I know I, I'd say they're ready to kill me at times, but, um, you know, I wouldn't, I couldn't say a bad word about any of them. I'd say they're nearly happy to be the back of us now at this stage. They're probably so sick of us. Uh, sorry, just on that, that school is Kinsale? Yeah, Kinsale Community School, yeah. The community School. I, I mean, there's not much left that you can win, no, even, I, I'd even left out those school awards, so congratulations on that. I was unaware of yesterday's award, but that, that's just a crowning achievement. Listen, um, on behalf of everybody at the Southern Star, we've been following your career since day one. We're absolutely thrilled for you with everything you've achieved so far. Hopefully, common sense will allow you to achieve some things at senior level at both sports over the coming weeks and months. But Fiona Keating, thanks for taking the time to speak to us on the Southern Star, Southern Star podcast. Uh, we wish you well over the coming weeks and months. Great stuff there from Fiona Keating. Now, before we preview Cork versus Loud, I just wanted to pause for a minute to chat to our friends over at Access Credit Union. The Star Sport Podcast is, of course, brought to you by Access Credit Union, your trusted local financial partner. Just recently, I went through the process of opening a current account with Access Credit Union, and I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that it's changed my life. I was able to open the account online during lockdown, which made the process completely hassle-free, and it was made even easier by the great support provided by Access Credit Union team leader, Amanda O'Sullivan, who joins me now. Amanda, I understand you can now apply for a credit union loan online as well. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, you can. If you thought applying for your current account was easy, um, you'll be delighted when you come to us for your car loan. Um, you can apply online just as long as you're registered for your online banking. A couple of clicks and it comes to us here in Access Credit Union. The personal touch still isn't lost. We'll still bring you back and discuss the loan with you. Um, and you can upload any supporting documents you needed, your uh, payslips, bank statements, that sort of thing. Um, we attach them here to your loan, assess the loan, and you can draw it down online. So we aim to do that all within 24 to 48 hours, depending on when you submit your documents. Um, and I suppose it was something that was in the pipeline for a while, but with COVID-19, it sped, on, sped us up to, to provide the service. Um, and it's really worked out well for us. And you know, for members being able to access their funds and still draw down their loan, it's been it's been a great asset to us really and to the community. I suppose, yeah, um, typically people always had to come into the credit union to draw down their loan. And, you know, for younger people who may not be living in the area anymore, we were inaccessible then. So now we're back back in the market for these these members again. Um, and hopefully they will they will support us as we are supporting local businesses. And you know, with every 10 euros spent in the locality, it generates 40 euros for the local economy. So in turn, the interest that you're paying on your loan in your local credit union goes back into your local economy. So you know, everyone's helping each other with this. Great stuff. Thanks very much, Amanda. And don't forget, Access Credit Union is your trusted local financial partner. Access your money 24-7 from anywhere in the world with an Access Credit Union current account and enjoy all the benefits while keeping your money local. On Saturday at 4pm in Park Equive, Division 3 Tabletoppers Cork take on bottom side Loud in the penultimate game of this year's National Football League. It's the first outing for Ronan McCarthy's men since their two-point win over Derry way back in March. So despite the fact they've already secured promotion for next season, this game is still hugely important with the Munster semi-final against Kerry less than a month away, Jor. Yeah, it is, Jack, because um, even though Ronan McCarthy during the week was kind of playing down the whole league campaign because of COVID and obviously, as you said, they're at the top of the table after winning their five games. But um, I, I think we should kind of step back from that statement and remember where Cork football was the previous two or three years and the, the poor re- results in the league and the poor run and the relegations 
they're in a good place right now in terms of their league position. They would be expected to be low and any kind of, especially this game and the Longford game away that will follow are very, very important for Ronan McCarthy. Not so much for the points and not so much finishing off an unbeaten league. Kemp want to do that. It's as you said, you need to get miles into the legs, proper competitive matches for the players that are available. But there's a bigger story probably for Ronan and the Cork set up over these next two games, and it's the injuries that have mounted up. They've already lost Kieran Sheehan, Liam O'Donnell from Clonakilty, Tomas Clancy from uh, from I know Mitchell Sounds, um, uh, Kevin Crow, or sorry, Kevin Crow, and Sean White as well, and Sean Potter are kind of long term absentees with, with niggling hamstring injuries. So these two matches probably take on even more importance in that the r- players you would have expected to put in to get ready for the Kerry game. We're not really sure what way McCarthy is going to go with his with his lineup. He's, it looks like he's going to have to delve into the under twenties and some of the players that have been playing particularly well towards the end of the club championship, perhaps. So I I, I suppose the real storylines coming out of the the Louth and the Longford games will not so much be the points and the way Cork play. It'll be who's playing in the key position. It's an indication of what way Cork will likely set up when they come to face Kerry. I well, just a name that you mentioned there, Kieran Sheen, and it's been great to see him back with the setup this year well earlier in the year it's a long time ago now but Joe it was still this season but it is massively disappointing to hear that news that was reported earlier in the week that he's not going to play any part considering where he'd come from and uh, you know he's one of those players who is just to watch in action is what we watch football for so massively disappointing that we're not going to see any more of him this year hopefully he'll come back stronger Yes I mean that that is that is the hope and I think reading between the lines out of some of the comments about uh, what has happened to him, I think the decision has been taken that whatever procedure he needs to get done, he should get it done now with a view to next year. Um, it's unfortunate for Kieran because I remember he, was it last year when they Aero played Bantry Blues the then intermediate semi-final down in Clonakilty, he wasn't long off the plane when he came on for the final 20 minutes and he was clearly not up fit, fitness levels weren't what they should be but he caught a couple of football Got a couple of balls, won a few frees, and he's just got that. He uses class, as you know. He's he's one of those rare breeds of a forward that no matter how badly the game is going and how little football in possession he might be getting, just he can always pull the trigger, get a goal or a couple of points out of nothing. And at inter county level, Cork desperately needs something like that. They have quite a young setup, and um, and for Kieran too, I think it's disappointing because um, as we reported last week in the start, defeated. Um, uh, O'Donovan Rossa in the Senior A semi-final this year and they've got a couple of really good young players coming through like Colin McCallaghan and they still have Daniel Goulding so they're like if they're to win that game that county final against uh, Mallow whenever it is rearranged for they'll be a Premier Senior team next year and a Premier Senior team experience Daniel Goulding Kieran some of the young players Air Roger producing will be a force at that level they may not win it but they'll certainly be a team to watch out for so it's especially disappointing for him, but there's been a litany of injuries, which is to be expected at the tail end of, of a club championship when players, I think, have had so little lead in time that they normally would have around the summer. They'd be training inter-county club. Um, I think these injuries were to be expected. But look, let's be positive about it from Cork's point of view. It's not like um, Rowan McCarthy is short of options up front. He's got Damien Gore from Kilmacaby, the likes of Jack McCarthy from Carrigaline is coming through. Blake Murphy's another player to watch out for from St. Vincent's. Um, and there, there's there's options. I mean, there, there are options from that under-20 team that did so well over the last couple of years under Keith Ricken. And I'd be positive about McCarthy's chances over the next two games of, you know, moulding some sort of a starting 15 together that will trouble Kerry. That's what we want. We want forwards that are going to trouble them. We showed last year that if you go at Kerry and really go at them, you need to be able to go at them now for a full 60 minutes, I'll be granted that you, you're in with a fighting chance. Um, and I, 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 I'm hoping Cork will put in a performance when the time comes around that Kerry game. But what will be fascinating to see over the next two league games, starting with Louth at the weekend, is how does he set the team up and who's available to him and who's he going to go with um, come championship time. That They're the real big kind of questions, I think. McCarthy needs answers to himself, but um, we'll get a very good idea of that once the Louth and Longford games have been completed. But yeah, just um, taking the Loud and Longford games into account then and the earlier games in the league. So Cork had been travelling nicely, as we know, in the early stages, winning their games by an average of around five points. And as you say, it's hard to know what to read into those formulas as we approach the Kerry game. But I saw a good tweet from John O'Connor of Sporting Cork during the week where he said that he got his first, I hear Cork are going well in training text from a <laughs> Kerry person today. Never not at it. So already... The airing is starting. 
And if that doesn't make you happy that football is back, I don't know what will. But from your own contacts and your own sources, Joe, what kind of feelings are you getting from the core camp? Is it as exciting as John O'Connor's Kerry friend is suggesting? Are there confident vibes coming for Verona and Carton's camp? Or is it a closed camp? Uh, to be fair, John O'Connor's tweet like that is kind of an annual event now. And I know John from my time on Sporting Cork, so he'll, he'll only be start looking to stir the pot as quickly as he can. And think about it, it's probably Kieran McCarthy got on to him. <laughs> if you think about it, probably him just started it. Um, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't say I have direct knowledge of how, from any particular players, of how things have gone in the Cork camp, but from people who have and from speaking briefly to them, there's a nice, quiet vibe around the, around the squad this year. There's a, a determination and a quiet determination usually into the summer like the newspapers have got like a two maybe two, maybe a two week even more lead in to when Cork play Kerry and it really ramps up the week before because of the time of year and because there's not going to be any fans there or supporters there it's going to be very very different but that's good for Cork I think that that on I don't think it unsettles players because once the ball is thrown in if you ask any player they don't really notice the fact that there aren't fans there they're so focused in on what they're doing I suppose what I'm getting at is that because it's a very, very unique time of year to be playing Kerry and because, again, expectations are so low in Cork right now in Cork football over the past couple of years because the bar has been set quite low. I'd still, because we're hearing absolutely nothing particularly bad except injuries and we're hearing very little, that suits fine. And I think that's probably what rattles the ferryman and Kerry women at this time of year. They like to hear it on very, very well for Cork and they point to their league record. But remember... Cork have been relegated down to this division that they're currently playing and they need to get out of it. And if they are going to regionalise the, the National League next year, which is being talked about because of COVID, they may not be playing some of the teams anyway. It may be irrelevant. But vital for Cork is that they tap into the Brian Hurley, the Mark Collins performances in the county semi, the, the Castle Laven contingent, Damien Callan. Uh, or sorry, not Damien Callan, because with the hurlers, like, but we need to, they need to build on some of the positive displays that we've seen at the club championship this year. Nemo have been very, very good. Luke Connie looks like he's he's back to his old self. Um, we mentioned Mark Cronin. There's a couple of young players as well in that Nemo team. And the Bears, like, there's the likes of Stephen Sherlock, who's been knocking on the door to Cork setup. Is this his chance now to force his way in? We're not short quality in Cork. What we need is consistency. That's the one thing that's been missing. Um, since McCarthy took over and I think it's the thing that probably troubles him the most he's getting as much as he possibly can out of the players he's got at his disposal at the moment but I, I firmly believe when it comes down to a Cork Kerry game it's the old cliche it really does go out the window because if you get at Kerry as I said and you get into their faces and you put it up to them like Cork did last year for as long as you possibly can if you're in there with 10-15 minutes to go you've got nothing to lose nobody expects Cork to win again this year so why not go for it I'd rather go for it as a Cork manager and lose by 10 points, but at least having a go. If you put 13, 14 behind the ball and try and contain teams like this, it's not going to work. It hasn't worked in the past. So you, you need a kind of a game plan. What Cork have is the beginnings of a lot of young attacking talent coming out of that Keith Rickon setup at under 20 and minor level as well that are coming through. That have no fear of Kerry, remember, because they've beaten Kerry at 20 and minor level now the last couple of years. Probably more so than they've lost to them over the last three or four years. So maybe that kind of maybe all the stuff the Yeras and the stuff that we put on our shoulders as Cork supporters and, and, and you know uh, fans for whatever number of years isn't on their shoulders they, why would they fear Kerry when they've not asked them at underage level so I, I'm hoping that kind of little bit of Cork arrogance maybe a little bit of self-belief um, and a, why, why shouldn't we win attitude when they go toe to toe with Kerry now we know what Kerry bring we've also been watching the Kerry Championship so we can see the likes of Clifford and a few others they are amongst the best players in the country but on any given day, in a quiet setting and at a different time of the year, I think Cork, if they play well over the next two games, if they go in with the right attitude and if McCarthy can come up with a game plan to release the speed and get those young forwards, especially the likes of Gore and Brian Hurley. Don't tell me a forward line with Damien Gore and Brian Hurley can't hurt you. Of course it can, but you've got to get the ball into them. And I think it will. I think this season, will boil, the Kerry game will boil down to can our defence hold their attack? But they'd be probably asking the same question. Um, we're not expected to beat Kerry. But we're fighting chance, and why not? And what we will learn over these next couple of weeks with the two games with Lowe and Longford and the information that will slowly drip out, possibly from training and seeing how things are going. Um, and, and injuries would play a big role here, uh, you know, Jack. I mean, Sean, a fully fit Sean Potter and a fully fit Sean White would be a big difference against Kerry. But if they're not there, it's time for others now to step up. It really is time to step up. Um, and because you're taking on the old enemy, because you'll hear all the errors coming into it and the carrier on an awful state, even though we've seen their players and their quality players at top and top 
you know, at top speed and knocking over some amazing scores in the Kerry Club Championship, it's likely to be a shootout and a high scoring affair. But there's no reason if Cork don't believe in themselves and don't have a proper game plan that they can't rattle the kingdom. And I certainly think I'd be expecting a very, very close game when the time does come. Absolutely. And just listening back to your conversation with Mark Collins from last week's podcast, after you finished talking about the Castlehaven semi-final, you kind of looked ahead to him going back in with the Cork team and there was definitely a hunger in his voice. He was excited. I know he was disappointed that the county final wasn't going to go ahead, but he wasn't and he wasn't quite dismissing that as a non-issue. But he was definitely excited about getting back into the ticketings with Cork, he was speaking about meeting the Barris lads and the Nemo lads in a training, and you could definitely sense uh, Joe, he, he he wanted to get back in there, and hopefully um, most of the other Cork players are excited to get back in there as well. And just to finish up then, the Munster final, as we know, is a few weeks away. That's fixed for Porky Cueve on November the 8th, and it's obviously too early to get a prediction from you, Joe, because we want to see how things unfold in the last two rounds of the league. But the championship is straight knockout this year, there's no back door, so it's basically a shot to nothing for Cork. And as you rightly said, they'll have no reason to be fearful. So we should really be in for a cracker of a game, shouldn't we? We should, and you're, you're right to allude to like to Mark Collins, as you said there, because he's a key player for Cork this year. De McCarthy deploys a midfielder up, up front, but I think there'll be a little. I think there's and this, this will be the the, the year of chance going back over the county bones. Now I think there's more pressure on Kerry because it's straight. You know, the, the cushion of a, of a back door has always been there for Cork, even though you expect them to put up a good display against Kerry at senior level over the last few years. They will be going for it. They'll be going for it. And positive. Can you imagine what a Cork victory over Kerry would do for football in the county at club and inter-county level? What a boost it would give. How it would rattle the whole country would take notice. And it would give Cork that confidence boost going into 2021 if we did manage to beat Kerry. I'm just saying, like, if you think positive and if you, if you keep those positive vibes and keep those nice vibes around the, the camp, there's no reason that Cork shouldn't be carry if they put in performance. If everyone is available to run McCarthy, which may not be the case, but if everyone's fit and this is it, is there a game plan there where we can exploit their weaknesses? Franks are, but can we exploit Kerry's weaknesses and can we pick the right players in the right positions on the day to do the job? To do that, that will that's really what it will boil down to. But because it's straight knockout, as you said, it's going to be fascinating and it's going to be some build up. And I would imagine there's a certain sports editor in our lives who will be sitting uncomfortably for that week, and I look forward to that immensely. Absolutely. Well, on that note, let's leave the Cork versus Loud chat there and we'll take a quick break. Access Credit Union has always been at the heart of our community through good and bad times. We want to continue to play our part in helping our community through the COVID-19 crisis. As businesses reopen, we encourage our community to work together by staying local, borrowing locally and spending locally. Access Credit Union is here to help. Now, before we wrap things up this week, I just want to give a quick mention to yet more success for Irish rowers at the European Rowing Championships in Poznan. Last weekend, Skibbereen's Fintan McCarthy claimed bronze in the men's lightweight skulls with a time of 7 minutes, 2.15 seconds. Ballon colleagues Sanita Pospore became a double world and European champion after defending her women's single skulls title, clocking a winning time of 7 minutes, 36 seconds. Three more Skibbereen rowers also put in strong performances at the championships. Lydia Heafy, Lydia Heafy even, won the B final in the lightweight women's single. Emily Hegarty was in action, finishing fifth in the final of the women's pair alongside Tara Hanlon, while another Skibbereen rower, Aoife Casey, finished second alongside Margaret Kremen in the women's lightweight double skulls B final. Jur, the West Cork rowing success story shows no signs of slowing down, and unfortunately for us, we're probably going to have to deal with a second book from the sports editor, Kieran McCarthy, at some time in the future yeah well and fairness the first one was so good why not like and uh, if, if the skippering roars keep performing as you've just outlined there I'm delighted um, because he'd previously won gold last year and uh, it was great as, as I've said one of the key things about Kieran's book Something in the Water um, is when you hear the O'Donovan's speaking at the other you know coming you know winning silver like the first thing they said is that they were still disappointed they, they didn't win gold and here immediately after McCarthy had won you know a very what was a very very and he came third behind a, a Norwegian, I think an Italian. Um, you know, he said first that I'm disappointed not to win is the first thing out of his mouth. And like we we've if the Skibbereen Roars can get used 
to winning and still be disappointed and still keep pushing themselves to look for gold. I think that that bodes very, very well for the future of Skibbereen rowing. And as you said, hopefully, well, hopefully, yeah, we'll put put, put a little bit of reports that are maybe next Christmas we'll have another book and a, an updated version. Sure. Yeah, po- post post, post Olympics when um, Skibbereen rowers bring back more medals. Well, Joe, before we leave it then this week, I just want to maybe. Any pieces in this week's Southern Star you want to point to that people should be looking out for? Yeah, as, as always, um, I know a lot of sport has been canned and, and postponed, but there's still a huge amount of information, good good interviews out there. I was delighted to get quite a bit of time with Breed Stack, um, who is heading off to Australia, as everyone uh, everyone has probably heard at this stage. But that interview is, is worth taking a look at because we talk about some of the things that she hasn't mentioned in the other interviews, the like the, the whole art of tackling uh, in Aussie that she's not used to and her, her thoughts and on that and her thought process just you know heading off to Australia and the adventure ahead and obviously the Libby Coppinger piece because Libby has been quite topical this week with the issues between the Camogie and Ladies Football Associations at national level just to see how fed up and frustrated she is but how thankful she is that she still gets the opportunity to play both sport with Libby interview with Breed Stack but that's only part of what is another very very good and very deep and very informative sports section and that would be available in shops of course across West Cork from Thursday morning and if you can't make it to the shops you can always purchase a copy of the digital edition online just go to www.southernstar.ie forward slash e-paper and you can read the Southern Star on your computer tablet or smartphone for less than two euro per week an absolute bargain Jared thanks as always for joining us on this week's Star Sport podcast and thanks to everyone else for listening or viewing the Star Sport podcast we'll be back at the same time next week if you enjoy these shows please make sure to rate review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Slong a fall.